yeah. Yeah, should be, should go to red. There we go. Yeah, okay, brilliant, we are live. Um, well, thank you everybody for, for joining uh, today. As you can see, our speaker is on the screen and uh, I, Sam Westwood, are in the background, along with Ian, who will be sort of producing today. Um, this is, uh, we're sad to say, our last sort of rights talk at Wolverhampton. Uh, but we're very happy that uh, we have Bjorn to sort of wave us off. Uh, we do have one more talk in the, the series, which will be tomorrow, uh, and that will be by Edzard Ernst, and that will be produced by the Bristol team. If you are based at Bristol, you can still register and see the, the talk in person. Otherwise, you can join via the live stream and the link will be circulated if you register. So please make sure to register and the link can be found on our Twitter page and our website. Um, but enough of that, let's focus on uh, today's speaker. Today we're very happy to be joined by Bjorn Brems and I'm going to quickly give you a bit of background um, of Bjorn if you don't know already. Uh, so he was born and raised in Würzburg, um, a small university town in Germany. He did undergraduate studies there and in Umay, uh, Umay, Sweden, before he started uh, to work on his PhD in Würzburg. In the Department of Genetics and Neurobiology of the University, Bjorn worked on associative learning in the fruit fly under the supervision of Mark Heisenberg. And then after graduating in 2000, he moved to Houston, Texas for a postdoc with Jack Byrne studying operant learning in the sea slug um, and learning uh, physiological techniques to complement his training in genetics. After a postdoc in 2004, Bjorn moved to Berlin to work as an independent researcher with his own lab. He completed his affiliation five years later and received a Heisenberg Fellowship in the same year. Uh, ever since his first undergraduate research projects in Würzburg, his main research focus has been on how brains decide which actions to generate next and how they evaluate the consequences of these actions. And a link to a really nice interview where I uh, pinch that text from will be put in the uh, Q&A box. If you do have any questions for Bjorn, please do make sure to put them in the Q&A. Um, you can also follow Bjorn on Twitter and his blog page, which you can see on the slide there. So Bjorn, over to you. Um, take it away and thank you very <coughs> much for your time slide today. All right, thank you very much. I hope you can all see the slides because I cannot see the controls here from the uh, from the teams, let's see if I can show, if I can see any Q and A box. I see a chat, but nothing else. Uh, and this is, oh, Q and A, there you go. Now I can see that. All right, good. So I can try and see if I can uh, hop back and forth and see what, what's going on in there. So, um, good riddance. Academic publishers are abandoning publishing. Well, I first off, I have to admit that's, sort of in still in the future so there are they are abandoning publishing sort of um, so it may be a little bit wishful thinking on my part involved here but um, I'll try to spend my time here convincing you that we should actually keep pushing them out of the door if they're at least turning towards the door we should make sure that they leave through the door as quickly as possible and I'll start by giving you some of the reasons that I think um, it would be smart to make sure that the academic publishers that we've been relying on for quite some time now um, are actually leaving uh, the business that has been so profitable for them. One argument uh, that one can take is quality control. So what you see here uh, on the x-axis is the number of years from 2000 to uh, last year, 2020, and the number of retractions uh, that are being posted uh, in the scientific literature. This is probably PubMed, a database for uh, biomedical science, and you see that this is increasing quite dramatically over the years. Now one could say, well, this is because there's a lot of uh, increase in publications, and so one has to normalize it, of course, to a publication rate that's also increasing. 
uh, and this is a different data set. So here you see retractions over 10K, 10,000 publications. You see it's a very low number that's increasing exponentially. And so you see even with regard to number of publications, the, the uh, massive uh, increase in retractions due to all kinds of uh, major scientific reasons for why articles should be retracted from the scientific literature. So this seems to look like a, a really bad trend. And uh, I will in the next couple of slides refer several times to the recent John Maddox Prize winner, Elizabeth Bick, and uh, who has been tracking down mostly image duplications, but also other kinds of uh, errors and fraud in the scientific literature. And she actually is making the case that we have too few retractions. So for one, what she notices is, is that journals are very, very sluggish and slow uh, in uh, retracting articles that are being flagged for duplicated images, for instance. And so she'll be post regularly posting papers reported by me with big concerns about the uh, issues in the articles, but little action. And so she asked for help by emailing the editors to push and do something about the quality control issue. So how do we know that there are too few retractions other than the um, journals are not very proactive with retractions? Uh, from studies, we know that about 2% of authors admit to fraud. Um, 2 to 4% of images have been found to be manipulated, but only 0.04% of the articles are actually retracted. And so while this is increasing, apparently it still looks as if many more of these article articles would need to be retracted. And as we will see a little bit later in the presentation, retractions are really just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more at issue with the quality of the research in our uh, journals than just the retraction. But to give you a better quantitative idea of uh, what are the reasons for why something might want to be retracted and how often that actually then leads to a retraction, here is just one random example that I picked of the sort of um, duplications that, what, that uh, Elizabeth Bick could be uh, finding in these articles. So for instance, the green box here shows that these lanes in what seems to be, doesn't really matter what the data here are, seems to be a Western blot of some sort. These seem to be identical. Then these probably microscopy images in different groups seem to be identical, even though they should be different experiments. And the same here, the reds and the red all seem to be the same, even though they should be different experiments. So these are really serious concerns. And uh, how are the journals reacting to that? And this is a data that uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bick sent me. Uh, five years after she reported 782 cases of these kinds of image duplications that you just saw. And what you see is that the large majority of cases, nothing happens in five years. When I would say as, as a, as a casual observer that these kinds of image manipulations are quite uh, serious and quite obvious, obviously in need uh, of some kind of editorial action, but 65.5% of journals within a time frame of five years apparently do not take any actions of these, uh, for these kinds of uh, issues. So one of the things that Elizabeth Bick uh, then suggested was that the publishers may spend some money on staff that could really, you know, go ahead and uh, take these issues and invest it in a decent quality control, in a decent quality control, as she uh, writes here. Now, quality control is just one, if one looks at the scientific literature, it's just one in a long list of missing functionalities. Uh, and I'll go into these in a little bit more detail. I just want to flag this here as quality control being just one of a whole long list of issues that we have with the scientific literature. And we'll pick out a few of those uh, in a couple of minutes. Now, do the journals really have enough money to hire more people? Now, for since the last year, two, three years or so, we actually can say that with quite some confidence. 
So what we have known for a very long time, for many decades, in fact, is that the average scholarly article costs the taxpayer, depending on, uh, or irrespective of uh, how it is being paid for, uh, roughly between four and five thousand US dollars per article. And so to be charitable to the publishers, we'll say it's just only about four thousand uh, dollars per article that we pay them. And then from their uh, public statements, we know that the profit of those is about 30%, so about $1,200. And if you want to uh, establish a publishing business, you can go online and look at the different steps that uh, it takes to publish an academic article, and then look at um, salary scales. If you want to do this, uh, your business in a low income country, then it will be cheaper if you calculate salaries for, uh, on the US or EU level, then you end up with an, a very charitable cost. Usually it would, will be less, but a very charitable estimate of costs of publishing that article of about $600, which means that the, there are $2,200 left uh, that we pay the uh, publishers and that they spend on something else that is not related to either profits or publishing. So the so-called non-publication costs. And this, of course, uh, it incorporates a whole host of things. And uh, one of them we're going to go into a little bit more detail uh, in the next couple of slides. Interestingly, uh, and this is one of the uh, publications that triggered the title of this presentation, that uh, the publishers are leaving publishing. Elsevier, for one, is quite uh, obvious and straightforward and explicit and has been so for several years now that they're not publishers anymore. They're corporations formerly known as publishers, even though they're now growing from their roots in publishing. Now they're actually data analytics company. They offer knowledge and analytics, right? And this is what they also state on their homepage, not just on Twitter. Elsevier is a leader in information and analytics for customers across the, across the global research and health ecosystems. So what they have been doing is they have been adding companies, they've been buying, they've been using the money we paid them to buy tools and digital helpers outside of the publication aspect of the research workflow. So they now have most of the big publishers. Let's stick here now with those are the four major publishers that are dominating the market. And uh, they now have all of, no, almost all of them are now covering the research workflow from discovery over data analysis, writing the paper, publishing the paper, outreach, and then later assessment in terms of uh, citation analysis, for instance, and these sorts of things. So Elsevier, Holtzbrink, Holtzbrink, which owns Springer Nature and Digital Science, Wiley and Taylor and Francis, they now collect data, uh, not only on the content that uh, you and I um, are generating, but also on how we interact with this contact. So user data, uh, when we're using discovery uh, tools, analysis tools, writing tools like citing Mendeley or writing an overleaf, um, when we publish, of course, and then for our reach and assessment, the same is true. They collect data on what it is that we are doing. And so they do this not only on their websites, as you can see here, but also on all the tools that they offer. So here, for instance, depending on how and when you access uh, nature articles. You either have 21, 21 scanners that check what it is that you're doing, or 34, or 73, or just two. Uh, and uh, this depends on a, a, a variety of factors where essentially only nature will be able to tell you why they have more trackers under some circumstances and less trackers under other circumstances. But what they do is they collect the data and then essentially uh, use it for their own purposes and sell it. And uh, this, of course, is of uh, a major concern uh, if private companies are harvesting user data on publicly funded scientists. And so, the, for instance, the uh, main German funder, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, the DFG, has issued a scathing uh, statement on data tracking in research and how this is uh, deeply problematic not only for the research community, but of course also for the library community that uh, often stands or mainly stands between 
uh, as an intermediary between researchers and the publishers. Um, so this has been uh, quite a, a debate on how to solve this problem in the next coming upcoming time. Uh, but it's just one example of what the ex-publishers are using the money that we pay them for. So all of this uh, data that they collect from us is not just free. We don't only we not only give it to them. The, the, their capabilities of aggregating and analyzing and selling that data is heavily dependent on us paying them to buy these tools that we then use. So um, that's one aspect of what uh, publishers are using this money for. They're quite obviously, as you can see from the retraction data, they're quite obviously not interested in quality control. What they're interested in is your data. And so that's one of the reasons why I think replacing the journals that they offer us is long overdue. Here are some other examples and reasons why even before we discovered that they're spying on us, um, it was a good idea to try and replace journals as people before me have called. We've, I've found references that go back to the late 1990s where people have said that uh, journals need to be replaced by a modern information technological solution um, and uh, which but uh, have not really uh, gotten much traction at the time. Uh, but maybe now is a better time because there's things have accumulated in the last 30 years after our uh, journals went digital that now amount to three major problems. Uh, we already got a hint that the reliability of our research um, literature uh, leaves much to be desired. I'll give you a little bit uh, more on this, uh, some evidence that these retractions are really just the tip of the iceberg. The affordability remains a problem. You also saw that a little bit when you saw that more than half of what we pay the publishers doesn't go towards publishing. And there's a lot of functionalities that are missing from our literature that one would expect from any other uh, digital infrastructure today. And so we'll briefly go into these three aspects and why um, it's a, why, why those are broadly considered the most important issues uh, with our scientific uh, literature and infrastructure more generally. So reproducibility has been in, on, on the radar for a number of years now. You can see here, uh, five publications from the biomedical area where people, the authors here that you see named, the authors have claimed that either 51% is not reproducible or 89% of the literature is not reproducible of the experiments described here. But none of these were actual replication experiments in a way that one could um, verify the experiments that have been done. So the three uh, publications here on the right have been analyzing methods sections and then estimated how uh, well written is that method section to be able to reproduce the results. Those have been replication attempts in biomedical companies that have not uh, in Amgen and BioHealthCare, as you can see here, uh, that of course did not disclose the kind of experiments that they have done. So. There's also no way of verifying this. So people have gotten together uh, under, uh, in many cases, um, the guidance of initiatives such as the Open Science Framework uh, and with Brian Nosek uh, spearheading these initiatives and have done actual and, and started actual reproducibility projects. And what one has found, and I think this is given these high numbers that were quite shocking at the time, uh, it was even more shocking when the Open Science Collaboration Psychology found that indeed only 39% of the 100 experiments that they picked were reproducible. That was published in 2012, so that's not nine years ago. So this is an old hat. Since then, and this I think is quite uh, dramatic if I would um, or catastrophic even. If I would imagine my own research would only be 39% reproducible, I don't know what I would do. I would probably just uh, crawl into the fetal position and cry. So this is absolutely not uh, something I want to contemplate on, but this is uh, quite dramatic. So other fields started looking at this too. In the social sciences, they looked at 
their publications. I won't go into detail as to these uh, uh, to these graphs. Those are results of different high impact publications, as you can see here. And uh, this is evidence of whether they could reproduce it or they could not reproduce it successful 62%. So around 50%, a little bit more, better than psychology, but still uh, closer to 50% than 100% that one, one might want to exist. In economics, they've done a very similar experiment also there. 11 out of 18 uh, publications that they studied were successful, about 60%. And just today, published yesterday in the US, so coming in over here in the Europe um, in the early morning, is uh, the final, so this brand new data that just got published uh, less than 24 hours ago on the replication project in cancer research. And uh, there's two things that I'd like to draw your attention to. One is that the consortium tried initially to uh, replicate 193 experiments. And then you can see all of these things that were missing or were problematic and um, how well authors could help or clarify uh, uh, the protocol or whether the reagents were available or not code and, and so on. There were a lot of problems such that of those 193 experiments that were tried to replicate, not even half could actually perform uh, or started. And out of those 87, only 50 could actually be completed. So uh, that on its own is an indictment to the, the biomedical research literature of which I consider as a neuro, neuroscientist, I consider myself to be part of. Um, and this is something that, that absolutely needs mitigation and is, is, is not the kind of standard we should hold ourselves to. Uh, in the end, the total number of papers studied was 23, down from about 50 something. Uh, 50 experiments conducted with a total of 158 effects and 188 outcomes. There's also internal replications in there, so the numbers um, uh, vary depending on how exactly you look at the data. But what you see, if you plot uh, the p-values of the studied effects, what you find, if you look at here, this is the original effect size from you know, 0 or minus 5 to 25. And then this is the one that they found in the replication. Uh, then you see that in blue, you have the significant ones on those close to zero, not significant. You see a lot of them are not significant. So the distribution of effect sizes you can see is quite uh, um, positive and large uh, on the positive side, whereas here the distribution of uh, effect sizes is centered very close around zero and those that are not that are significantly different from zero are only a small proportion over here you can summarize it in words as they did in the abstract combining positive and null effects the success rate of reproducing the results was 46 percent so we're again at this 50 percent roughly 50 percent ballpark meaning that our problem is not really the 0.04 percent or maybe two percent or four percent of outright fraud or image, duplica image duplication. Our problem really is that it appears as if through over across a lot of experimental fields, maybe only every other paper is really reliable on average, right? It could be half of one paper and half of another paper, but on average, only half the information that we find in the scientific literature is reproducible. And I find this uh, dangerous and outrageous. Um, and something that uh, really needs an explanation and needs mitigation. So the summary of these data is that the most uh, that that half of the results in our scientific literature, on average, appears to be um, hard to reproduce. And as you could see, a lot of the data that were collected were collected from so-called high impact journals. So is that the upper end or the lower end of the scale? So if we go in other areas of, of uh, journal prestige and hierarchy, does it get worse or does it get better? One would assume that those are high impact journals, prestigious journals, that this is so to say the pinnacle, the best area of research, such that 
the rest of the literature should, one would naively expect, should be even worse. Now let's have a look if that is actually the case. I won't be able, to, I won't have the time to show you all those, all the data that have been done on this. There has been a lot of work on this over the previous decade or two, and I'll show you just three different aspects. Uh, this is uh, a study in um, structural biology where you generate a crystal and uh, you usually a crystal uh, from a protein or another uh, important molecule and then use uh, scattering techniques, uh, X-ray scattering techniques, for, in for instance, to derive a structure and to generate a computer model out of it. And they, this field has uh, managed to quantify the quality of these computer models. And each little dot on this plot is one such published computer model sorted by quality and grouped by journal. So you see on the x-axis, you see all the different journals. And on the y-axis, you see a quality measure that has been normalized to zero for the average quality. And because the quality in this case is a deviation from a perfect model, the further positive you go, the lower the quality, and the lower you go, so the more negative you go, the better the quality. So everything lower than zero is better than average. Everything above zero is worse than average. Everything marked by an asterisk and a color is significantly, in this case blue, better than average. And everything marked by red and an asterisk uh, by uh, journal is worse than average. And what we find is the opposite of what one would naively expect. The high impact journals such as Cell, Science, Nature or uh, PNAS they all are published significantly worse in terms of quality, significantly worse um, uh, structures, structured computer models. Now, one can think, one can think of any number of reasons why this is the case. This may be very competitive and it's important to be out first. Whatever one comes up with, the issue is, well, is this just structural biology? Could this be uh, something that's really particular? And so one looked at many other fields um, in many other measures. One of them is um, statistical power, which should be by convention about 80%. And what is plotted here is the impact factor of the journals. Every dot here is a neuroscience study with experimental animals in most cases. And the statistical power is plotted on the y-axis. And what one should see is that there is really a whole lot below 80% because 80% is the statistical to reach. But we don't, there appears to be no uh, relation whatsoever. And in fact, the very, the four very most high impact uh, studies that have been included here are just as likely to be, have nearly zero statistical power or very high statistical power. There's no relation whatsoever. So they're not better in this respect of methodology either. And it's a different field. So it's not only quality, it's methodology and a different field. Let's switch from methodology or quality to errors. So one way, um, and again, a different field, this is uh, in, in omics studies. So if you're genomics, metabolomics, very often what you do is uh, you write some code, you find a set of genes or proteins that are relevant to the, your research question and then uh, that your program spits out. And then you copy and paste that into an Excel spreadsheet um, to submit it with your manuscript for publication. And uh, the Microsoft Excel introduces so many errors into these copied and pasted gene names, usually uh, interprets them as dates, for instance. And uh, apparently it is easier to rename the human gene so that doesn't happen anymore than to change or ask Microsoft Excel or switch the program in a way that it doesn't do these errors anymore. Um, and so this is this is a considerable problem for this community. And uh, colleagues have gone and looked how often are, do these errors occur and where do they occur? And what one finds here that the overall average of these errors is about 20%. So one out of five studies with a, uh, a, a, an, a spreadsheet supplement uh, contains these errors. And in these uh, journals, it happens more often. And in these journals, it happens less often than average. And if one looks at the impact factor, the, the average impact factor of these journals, then it is higher. 
the average impact factor of these gels. So quality, methodology, errors are just three examples. There are many more um, that at least the high impact journals are not better uh, than the average journal. And in many cases, I've shown you some, uh, they're actually worse in terms of methodology and, and error wise, sloppy science. Uh, they're actually worse than average. So taking all of these data together, one can say that the high impact journals attract, seem to attract the most unreliable research and don't do uh, an overly good job in uh, trying to get rid of such unreliable science, such that what is published in those high impact journals very often is less reliable than is what is published in any other uh, average. So, so much for the reliability issue, that's retractions and uh, irreproducibility. Affordability. Well, recently Nature came out and said, well, we are such a great publication venue. You have to pay not the average four or five thousand. You have to pay more than 10,000 US dollars or 10,000 euros uh, for one article. And I said that, uh, and I showed the graph previously, that if one looks at the different steps that one needs to take in order to publish uh, an article, then one ends up with a charitable uh, cost of about 600 for such an article. Now, if you look at a, um, a company or an organization, an initiative that sits in a low, in low to middle income countries, you see it's much less than 600 US dollars and uh, some other companies that I've uh, listed here, they're also, this is roughly about the kind of cost that you can get with low labor costs. You will get probably maybe twice that if you have a low volume journal uh, and uh, high salary costs. And uh, one can take these calculations and say that nature, um, nature journal itself with a rejection rate of about 92%, should have roughly costs of about a thousand dollars per article so that such that nine thousand in the example of ten thousand euros or or dollars uh, would go towards other things other than publishing uh, so profit for instance uh, so it is quite clear that um, overspending that amount of money so for instance my library here at the university of Regensburg pays about two million euros every year in subscription costs or article costs in general, um, it means that we could save 90, about 90, 80 to 90 percent of that and spend it on something else. And uh, this is, of course, an affordability problem in and of itself. But of course, if we look at all the missing functionalities they would like to have, it also means that we're lacking the funds to buy these things that are important, for instance, for quality control, to keep the quality of our scientific literature up. Now, I've been talking about these functionalities now for quite some time. Let's have a look at what it is. Quality control, as we just mentioned, is one issue that's missing that we should be investing in, but the publishers are investing the money on surveillance uh, publishing. Uh, and we, the scholarly institutions, we don't have any more money because we pay it to the publishers to invest the money ourselves. Um, I've already also showed that the journal prestige correlates with unreliability. It's something we would need to fix. We don't really have a good, uh, I didn't talk about this today, we don't really have a good scientific impact analysis. Impact factor is a pretty much a made up number that correlates essentially a little bit with unreliability, but it correlates really, really well with prestige. That's all it does. It doesn't really measure citations in any meaningful way. Um, uh, it, it is more uh, a, a selling tool, uh, it appears, and the numbers are essentially fixed between Clarivate Analytics and the publishers. Peer review could be better in many ways. I'm sure many of you have made that experience in not only technically, technologically, but also in other uh, in other ways. Uh, we have transparency issues in a lot of uh, um, uh, in a lot of aspects. There's no effective sort filter and discovery solution. Uh, we're still uh, relying on keyword searches and these sorts of things, and so on. The hyperlinks are really messed up in many cases. We send still send static. Um, pictures instead of interactive visualizations of our data, which is in 2021, which is really absurd. And so on. there's many, many, many things that make our scientific literature sort of like the Internet in 1995. So those are all things we would like to have fixed, but the publishers really need their money for other things, quite obviously. And the problem with our infrastructure is not just papers, right? I mean, we produce text, data and code. 
So text may be bad, data is even worse. So this is a 10 year old report that shows that most of the data is actually not really made, ever made openly available and why it now 10 years on this may be slightly different. It's probably not dramatically different. But let's look at these things up here that are supposedly more um, safe and more accessible. Well, what one finds is that already in 1996, um, these databases where one posts one's research data uh, due to funding problems had issues that they may have to close. So many of these um, databases that are being shown in the previous study as being stable are actually quite fickle. And this is not something that is only 30 years old. In 2016, funding was a headline in Science Magazine, funding for key data resources sources is in jeopardy. And so what we find is that the availability of research data declines rapidly with article age. The older, older the article is, uh, eventually the data is gone and nobody can reproduce any of what uh, the people back then have done. And so if you think this is bad, it's actually even worse for code, for the code that we write. And without that code, you, the data is useless. You can't even visualize the data if you don't have the code used to understand the data. Otherwise, it's just zeros and ones or numbers. We have had a tradition in scholarship or in science. Oh, sorry for the typo in there. Uh, software this is what it should say. Um, we have a we've had we have had uh, a tradition of sharing software among researchers since 1953. One of the first um, one of the first uh, computers that you can see here. Nowadays, people use a commercial offering called GitHub that's owned by Microsoft. And uh, if that is doesn't seem to be like a big issue uh, that our scientific code is mainly uh, hosted by Microsoft then one should just look at what Microsoft did with Microsoft Books when they found out that this is not really something that they can make a lot of money out, out of, they close it. And they just took their books with them. So if you had a book with Microsoft Books, it's gone now when they, because they just closed it. And that can happen um, with uh, our code as well. If Microsoft decides ah, GitHub isn't really something worth keeping, they can close it and all the scientific code is no longer accessible. And one can just hope that the authors of the code are still alive, the developers, and so they can make it accessible somewhere else, maybe on their institutions. And this is something I apologize that this is in German. This is something that our university has done. The, um, the pandemic has sparked a lot of digital initiatives and a lot of institutions that have been uh, digitally dormant or have spent the last 30 years in a digital cave. And one of them at our institution, at least, is that they've uh, installed a GitLab version, which does, as the similar name implies, does similar things. It takes care of your code and does a little bit of version control. And uh, so when I contacted them and said, oh, this is really great. I want to have our GitLab, GitHub repositories. I want to have them mirrored with GitLab because this is a functionality that exists. It's called pull mirroring, um, such that automatically everything that's on GitHub is copied to GitLab such that if Microsoft takes GitHub away, GitLab is still around and our code is still there and we can reference it always in the papers. We can reference the GitLab repository. So no matter what Microsoft does, readers will always be able to find our code. The reply uh, I got when I asked, because I couldn't find this functionality, when I asked uh, our computing center where that is, and uh, this is here in German, I've translated it for you. We have installed the free version of GitLab. Which in, in which pull mirroring with GitHub is not included as a functionality. So again, our university is paying so much for ex-publishers that they don't even afford or don't even think about installing a version that makes this the use of this uh, repository of this uh, service even useful. So this is uh, one of those issues. And so, uh, how do we solve those three issues? Because they all relate to each other, right? The affordability makes the, or the affordability problem makes the other two problems worse. The functionality problem makes the reproducibility problem worse, and so on. So they 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 um, interact with each other, and in the center are our journals. And so uh, we have recently published a new call, uh, twenty years on from the first calls that we found that we should replace academic journals with a modern with a modern solution. Now, how could we get there? And how could this and what would this replacement this replacement look like? So how would we get there? Well, 
we could use it by tackling the affordability problem. We saw that if we can find a way to pay publishers for their services, their publication services, the publication cost would be very small. Now, the article cost, as we said, that we're paying now uh, is about four to 5,000. Now, if we look at the number of articles published, and if we would find a way to have replaceable service provider compete so that they compete for the lowest cost um, publishing services, then we would have globally, worldwide, uh, per year, about between nine and or about nine in this case, in this specific example, 9.56 billion euros or dollars uh, that we could spend on a modern replacement. Now, if you're anything like me, you have no idea what you can buy for $9.5 billion every single year. Um, and so I looked it up. Uh, the International Space Station, if you distribute the costs over the lifetime of the space station, space station costs about $3 billion per year. And uh, the Large Hadron Collider, if you do the same thing, costs about $2 billion per year. So if only we converted our monopoly system where each journal is a monopoly um, that you can't replace with a market system where service providers would compete for publishing services, uh, we could buy another and build and run another LHC and another International Space Station and still have a couple of billion left over uh, to build infrastructure for our data and our code that we're currently uh, missing and make sure that our databases are do not have any funding problems anymore. So what would we get? Well, the important thing is that we get really substitutable services. How could one have that? I will give an example uh, after these slides here. Uh, it would mean that these services would be paid by the university right now or by the institution, just as they pay electricity, the furniture, uh, and other non-digital infrastructure. Right? It would be an infrastructure that would be run in the background and invisible. That's what good, good infrastructure is invisible. That's what would happen, and so you wouldn't have any author-facing costs. If there were any functionalities in the old journals that you wanted to copy, well, it's digitally can copy anything in more ways than just one. Um, the solutions for data and code, as I've shown here on the left, would be cost neutral. You wouldn't force anybody to use it because if you don't pay journals anymore, there are no journals around. So if authors don't have any journals where they can publish and they instead have for free a system where they just write their paper and click on publish, then of course people will do that uh, simply because everything else would be insane. And if there are no journals, there's no need to judge anybody by journal quality because there are no journals and so on and so on. Uh, lots of different advantages that I can't go into all uh, uh, by detail. Those are the most important ones. And the side effect of that is of course, it's as open as we want it to make, right? If you want to have some area where we don't want the public to look into really uh, scary initial results, then we can do that. And if we think, you know, everything must be completely open, well, then we make it open. We don't have to go to publishers and ask them nicely, oh, pretty please, can you do as we want uh, and not charge us double for it? No, because we own this thing, we can do whatever we want with it. Now, this sounds like a pie in the sky, but in fact, uh, there are uh, alternatives that we can either use or we can clone and use it the way we want. Uh, there's something called Open Research Central. Uh, this is where um, you can search for articles in a single place. And uh, there's a bunch of organizations that already have publishing platforms there. So here's an example. So for instance, uh, the European Commission has its Open Research Europe platform uh, where, funder, where, where uh, authors that are funded by the European Union can publish their articles for free. And there are many other organizations that you can see here on the right. There are many other organizations that have uh, platforms uh, on Open Research Central. And if every single scholarly institution would have a platform on a platform like Open Research Central or a framework like Open Research Central, it doesn't have to be Open Research Central, right? But something like this, you would have immediately a, an entire database of all of the world's institutional research. And uh, you would have no more journals. And every institution can run their own platform the way they want. Uh, and so they can either do it themselves with people that are employed by the university, or they can hire Elsevier, Wiley, or anybody else uh, to 
run this platform for any number of years and then they can have a bidding contest for the next year, just like Open Research Europe was awarded to F1000 Research um, via a bidding process. And so everything that the university or that public institutions spend money on have to be awarded by bidding processes, by a tender process. And this is how publication should also take place. Now we can do that. And this would create a new market where the publishers would compete for us and we wouldn't compete for slots in certain journals. And this is what drives prices down and with the remaining money, we can spend it on all kinds of things. Something, the most important aspects of such a new system would be that it would, the publications would be dynamic and version controlled, not static. They of course can be searched in text mine, which is a real big problem right now. You publish when you hit publish. When all the authors have, have hit publish on their screens, the article would be public and you can have all kinds of uh, different models for post-publication review, such that you wouldn't have a single step from non-peer reviewed to peer reviewed, but you'd have many, many layers like an onion of reliability checks, such that eventually, um, if your article has stood the text, test of time, we know what are the reliable findings and what are the less reliable findings. You can have contributorship in all kinds of roles. The paper is not really so important anymore because you have data, you have code, pre-registrations, reviews, all of these things. They would be open to everyone. So you could say that this is sort of like that the Copernican revolution in uh, scientific publishing towards a heliocentric model of open science where the scientific process would be in the middle and then papers would just be one aspect of a narrative that is of course still important, but hypotheses are important too. The previous research, methods, data and code, theory, those are all important. And those are all revolving around the scientific process. And if we just ditch journals and replace them with modern technology, then we could have that. Now, this is the money side and this is the technological side. The political side has always been the most important one. This is the last slide uh, to finish this up. How could we get there? Clearly, we could have done this, started to do this 30 years ago, but we haven't. Our institutions haven't really invested a whole lot in digital infrastructure in the last 30 years. Why, that, you know, they, they, why they have done that is one question that is not so easy to answer. But what one could, can answer is how can we make our institutions change and apparently since they haven't done anything for 30 years they need incentives to do something and who has these incentives funding agencies funding agencies and you see a list of european coalition s members here with links to their eligibility criteria their policies they say you have to have certain basic infrastructure if you want your members to apply for funding with us and so what these funders could do if they really would be interested in open science, if they really would be interested in making science reliable, the science that they fund be more reproducible than just 50%. They could say that if you, if you as a research institution, if you don't show us evidence uh, or a certification maybe, that you are investing money into an infrastructure that makes sure that these three major issues are being addressed, then you're not eligible for funding. And so all of these funders have these eligibility criteria and we propose in the article that I uh, showed a, uh, a couple of slides earlier, we propose that this is a way how we can force uh, reluctant scholarly institutions to finally try and catch up with the technological developments of the last 30 years and provide researchers with the kind of digital infrastructure that 2021 has to offer. And we, suppose, uh, we propose to use the money we're currently wasting on non-publication costs for the ex -publish on the ex-publishers that are just using it against us uh, to actually invest that money in something that helps us and serves us, which I find would be quite smart. Now with that, uh, I think I've hoped I've covered all of the reasons why we need to replace journals. Um, how we could do it in terms of money and technology and an idea, one of several, an idea of how we can get our institutions to actually spend that kind of money that we need for this upgrade. So, and with that, I will close my presentation, stop the presentation here, and I hope now that if I go back to 
Uh, the Teams window, I should, uh, yes, I should be visible again and uh, the screen should not be shared anymore. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Bjorn, that was absolutely fantastic. Filled with useful facts and, and just to say a uh, really nice positive response from the audience. Dave of Colhoun, um, a regular, said brilliant talk. I'm, I've been advocating something like this for many years. You produce numbers that are very compelling indeed. Thank you very much indeed. And yeah, I think that speaks for a lot of people that attended and those that will watch the video afterwards. Um, if people do have any questions, there are a few things in the Q&A which I'll read to you so you don't need to sort of flip between them. Uh, Gavin Beat is, is part of the sort of library services at King's College London just mentioned a few things that might be useful for people watching the video. Uh, Bat said that it's not a question, just a comment, but the cost of nature APCs is a scandal. Cell press, uh, not much better. He also put a link to the open access button as well which can give you an idea of, of papers who are, who are open access. We do have one question from uh, Anonymous, uh, uh, which is F1000 Research is still a, a for-profit commercial company, isn't it? Yes, it is. But if you have a market, then this is not really a problem because then they compete. This is only a problem as long as the participants are monopolists, right? So the EU regulators, for instance, whenever there's a merger in this area, they make a market assessment and they say that, oh yeah, the publishers are not substitutable. So each publisher with their offering is a monopoly on its own. And in effect, each article, because it only uh, is pub ever published in one journal, each article is its own monopoly. And so this is one of the main issues with having commercial publishers in there is that they can ask what they want. That's the reason why these costs are so high is because there's no way to exert any market pressure. Whereas if you're bidding and F1000 research turns out for the same service level to be too expensive, you just pick a different one. And the nice thing is that now also nonprofit organizations are starting to position themselves as service providers uh, such that you can even say that uh, as an institution, no, we don't find it ethical to spend public money on for-profit service providers. Um, and so we only go by non-profit organizations. So, but if, if you have a well-functioning regulated market, there is no issue with uh, private companies. I mean, after all, there are private companies coming in and fixing our electricity, our, our ventilation system. This is not all done in-house. We pay companies to do that. And because when we find out or to or, or to clean the buildings and, and uh, if we find out that the service is bad and the price is high, we go with the different or the institutions just pick a different company. And as long as the companies become substitutable, that's a core important aspect is as long as the companies are substitutable, it doesn't matter. Very good. I have a few questions, uh, actually, uh, which I like your thoughts on. So, so one is actually going back to the point you were making about this sort of um, association between sort of journal impact factor and I guess prestige and, uh, and quality. And so it's been said for a while now that you get more retractions with higher impact journals and the, and the quality is, is poorer. Uh, but one of the arguments I've heard, which I want you to comment on, is well, these journals typically get greater scrutiny. And so, you, so there's a disproportionate, uh, it's not surprising that you get a disproportionate number of sort of retractions or issues with quality because they get more attention. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, um, so this is a good argument. And uh, however, it is not easy to back that up by any data. So it's just an argument. If one looks at, so if one looks at the total number of retractions. So, the, and so let me rephrase the argument. The argument is that, well, to, to make it a little bit more extreme, or well, nobody looks at the other articles in no-name journals, who wants to retract those? Of course, everybody just retracts the high-impact ones. But in fact, the absolute number of retractions is much higher in the low-impact journals because there are many more journals, which means that if, if nobody would be interested in retracting those journals, there should be uh, in direct retracting those articles, there should also be lower retractions in absolute numbers, right? But it's not. So there is a high interest in readers uh, to force retractions. And you can see this in the in the quotes by Elizabeth Bick, right? She wants people want stuff that's wrong to be retracted. 
And uh, it's just that you find many more of those. Now, you could say, again, the argument is, um, this is because there's more effort being put into the high uh, retraction uh, journals or the high impact journals, which are also high retraction journals. And so because this is very hard to pin down by evidence, uh, I usually say that, so you can find evidence for both arguments, right? Um, for both sides of the argument. I usually say that retractions are useless and they're only, you know, they're only a small percentage about from on the literature. You know, if you look at uh, replicability being around 50%, who cares about one or 2% retractions? That's, that's it's, it's a blip in an ocean, right? And so if one wants to look at the pernicious effect that journal rank has, look at reproducibility. And it looks like, you know, the 50% is actually on the good side, right? The cancer research was done and, and, and it was done in high impact journals and it's now not even 50%. So most likely average reproducibility, uh, if, if the current data that uh, are representative, that the current that we have, it's not that many, right? But if one would continue to do these kinds of reproducibility projects in, in many other fields and in many different journals for the next, I don't know, 50 years, Probably, uh, if current data is anything to go by, what one will find is that reproducibility is by and large less than 50%, uh, maybe just under 50% in the high impact journals and just over 50% in the rest of the journals. These effects are not large. Mm. These effects are not large. But if you reward people that publish in the less than 50% journals, and you kick those that publish the more than 50% reproducibility out of science, you don't need to be an evolutionary biologist to realize what's going to happen after 30 years, right? Your reproducibility is going to drop. Mm -hmm. And so the reproducibility, the reproducibility issues that we're, that we're looking at, as far as I can tell from the data that I have available, uh, seem to be a very much house-made problem, is that if we hadn't rewarded publication in journals that publish unreliable science, we would not have so much unreliable science around. Yes, very good. Um, I, I'm conscious of time, but you, uh, is it still okay if we run over Bjorn or do you have to rush off? Um, no, I'm fine. It's okay. okay. For, I, have a, I have a few more minutes. I'm looking also, okay. I'm also looking here at the uh, yeah, at the so Q and A, but since yeah. uh, you're the moderator, you go and pick. Yeah, you so go I'll, and pick I'll the just questions. read them aloud um, uh, for the courtesy of the people who watch this sort of, uh, uh, on playback. Um, so one question is, it will be hard to change the whole system. Uh, on a smaller scale, it might be interesting to know uh, what do your colleagues in Regensburg think about your vision? Ha, yes, I can, there's two answers to this. For one, the smaller scale has been tried for 30 years, right? The smaller scale has, been, has given us um, archive in physics, which exists since 1991 and hasn't really changed anything other than that people in physics, in these fields that are on physics, now only publish in those articles and then don't read them. So the journals that are covered by archive still exist, are still being paid to the tune of 5k per article, but nobody reads them anymore because everybody's on archive, which I find quite absurd. Uh, and then another small scale thing that people have tried is um, uh, open access journals, and uh, we saw the we saw the example of a ten thousand euro article for open access uh, APCs, and so this is uh, not what I would call a significant improvement. And so that's one answer: is that we've tried for thirty years now. Uh, lots of people have tried small scale solutions, and they all have failed essentially, or have made things worse. Um, and what about our people here in Ringsburg? Well, uh, I'm in the library committee, and uh, people find that. Uh, very palatable. They would like to do that today, but of course they don't want to do this alone because there's no point in everybody in Regensburg not participating in journal publishing anymore if, if uh, everybody else is still doing it. Uh, that's one aspect. The other aspect is that uh, here in particular here in Germany, uh, we now have a consortium that's called DEAL, D-E-A-L, uh, in capital letters that is negotiating with these big publishers and everybody by now has realized and this was started i think around 2012 or 13 so it's been going on for a while and people now have realized what a horrible mistake that was 
And uh, I don't think anybody in the library committee here in Regensburg finds this deal, deal, uh, sorry, uh, very attractive anymore. But everyone is so happy after so many years of neoliberal competition that we're all in the same boat, that we're all cooperating to try and stick it to the big publishers, that they don't dare, nobody wants to be the person, the first institution to drop out of the team. So everyone says, well, you know, yes, we know it's too expensive. We know it's actually stupid. We know it's counterproductive, but we really, after so many years of cooperation, we really can't pull out now. So you see all kinds of social factors factor in such that people who know that it's counterproductive, who know that it's a waste of money, they still stay in there for social reasons. Is that no, we can't really be the 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 you know the, the the egoistical people that are ruining the team effort of the last ten years or so, or seven years or whatever it was. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, the UK is a good example of that actually, Bjorn, with with the recent JISC Elsevier negotiations. So the UK the UK higher education sector pays between 40 and 50 million a year, which is set to increase. Um, so that sort of soppy soppy approach is, is seems to have the equivalent effect. Um, so one question from Hannah here. So how can we uh, ever achieve a journal free academic landscape? It seems like uh, everyone has to be on it in change. Uh, I, it wouldn't work if, for example, only one university stopped paying journals or only one funding agency mandates change. Yes, exactly. So this is this is a formulation of what has been called the collective action problem for several decades now. And essentially the plan that we're uh, proposing in this in the article that I referenced essentially tries to minimize the collective action problem. It's always going to be a collective action problem. Uh, I think looking back 30 years now in hindsight, that's always easy to say the the mistake in the early years was to think that the collective action should be solved on the researcher level. Well, we now are 12 million researchers. So essentially the task would involve to force or convince 12 million researchers to risk their careers for the good of, hum of humanity. Uh, I think this is an uphill battle. The next, what I've done for about 10 years now is try to convince libraries, which are much fewer, library director, many few, much fewer, there are about 30,000 roughly, an estimate of about 30,000 library directors that could have uh, an impact on where the money goes. And after 10 years of trying to convince libraries uh, that they uh, should help us in this respect uh, without any effect, um, we got the idea that hmm, there is actually a group of people that actually is even fewer than 30,000, and that's the decision makers in funding agencies. So yes, and those are probably only just a few hundred. And if one takes the most uh, well-funded research agencies that you, you, you would need as a some sort of crystallization point, uh, it's probably even fewer than that. So one would essentially what one would have to do. So from in the, you know, in the 90s, the issue was, oh, like Stephen Harnard always said, oh, if everyone just posted everything on uh, their own servers, then nobody would need subscriptions anymore. Uh, but now the issue has become to wait, we only have to get for instance, is Coalition S funders to put their mouth, uh, or their money where their mouth is, right? Because they say they want to support open access, they want to support open science, and, and of course, it doesn't need to be said that they want to support rel the reliability of science. So, if we don't have, so we don't have to convince 12 million or 14 million uh, researchers, eight, I think it's 8 million full-time equivalents, to risk their careers, careers worldwide, we just, just have to get, let's say, 100 decision makers or 100 funding agencies with their individual decision makers inside them to follow up on what they already want, namely reliable science, open science, and then use their eligibility criteria, which are different from country to country, from funder to funder, to try and come up with ideas of how to coax institutions to divert money. So to say that, well, you know, if you're not investing money in open science, that is reliable science, well, then how can we give you any funding if the fund, if, if it turns out that you're wasting those funds on something on, 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 on a scientific um, system that's uh, only 50% reliable? We want more than 
And so I would argue that this is the collective action problem that has been realized uh, to be such a problem for two or three decades now has never been as small as it is when you see it from that perspective that funders have incentive control not only over the recipients of their funds, the direct recipients, but the institutions where the recipients sit. Brilliant. Um, that's fantastic. I don't know whether to touch on a point that I wanted to raise on that, but maybe let's just get David Colhoun's point uh, questions here. So um, he asks, to what extent is the problem in implementing your ideas attributable to the following? One, senior PIs who remain obsessed with nature, etc. And two, university managers who remain obsessed with metrics. Yes, trick. that is probably, uh, hi David, that is probably paying, playing quite a large role uh, in a lot of, in too many ways I could detail now. It's, it's difficult to get uh, data or evidence on this more than, you know, the impression that one gets when one reads, um, uh, when one reads what university leadership thinks, in what way they think their university uh, is better than others. Uh, and in which researchers talk about their own publications. Um, so to quantify this contribution is very difficult. But the case I think can be made that in the 1980s, institutions took a lot of money that wasn't just lying around like now with the, with the ex-publishers money that we're wasting. They took money and innovated and invested into in a technology that they didn't know how much it would help us and help their mission of research and teaching the internet. They pulled cables, installed routers, software. This was uh, they, they uh, installed things like Gopher, if people remember that from the early 90s and Mbone, the multicast backbone, and then eventually uh, the National Supercomputing uh, Center in, in Urbana-Champaign in Illinois. They created uh, the Mosaic browser, the first browser. Um, that we then used. This was all done in the hope that these sorts of new technologies would further the mission of research and teaching. And then, just when sort of the first university rankings came around, it all stopped. And now, what universities are doing now, they're they're in investing full time equivalents into polishing their data so they move up the rankings without actually changing anything. So I think um, it is quite, one can make a quite solid case without ha having actually good data on this, at least not to my knowledge, one can make a quite a solid case that it's precisely the ranking and the metrics that have stopped universities from becoming better in the hope of looking better. That, you know, show over substance is something that has increased dramatically uh, since the mid 90s and has coincided. We don't, well, we don't know, you know, if correlation is, is, is also causation. Right, but the correlation can be observed. And so I'm trying not to put too much effort into looking for any causality and instead see the proposal for the funders as a way to whatever the causality is, whatever the reasons they might have, imaginary or otherwise, whatever reasons institutions have to not provide us with the infrastructure that we've actually been waiting for for 30 years, uh, whatever the reasons are, well, if they don't want to do it on them by, their, by themselves, and if even researchers asking for it doesn't help, well, then let's force them. And, and funders are in a position to force them. And uh, funders, hopefully, if one looks at the Plan S and how it was uh, developed, um, have both the intention and the power to do so, and hopefully also the independence to do so. But that remains to be seen. Uh, brilliant. Um, so a couple of uh things have come through as you were talking. So one is from uh, Gavin again. So to be fair, uh, libraries have been advocating on this for years, but we haven't always been able to get institutional buy-in across the sector. Um, uh, Hannah also uh, sort of, I guess, a follow-up comment to your reply earlier, Bjorn, was isn't it also a bit of a chicken and egg problem as well? We need money to build the infrastructure, but we can't remove our money from journals unless there is an alternative infrastructure. Yes, both both points are absolutely correct. The first first point in my 10 years in interacting with librarians and libraries all over the world has been that the, the people have either said, oh, you're totally crazy, it's never going to work. Or they said, oh, yes, I wish we could do it, but we can't. 
all the way to, oh, if I would be doing this, I would lose my job. So um, yes, this is not a new idea. I mean, the goal for, for you know, changing and, and, or, or, or you know, replacing journals has been around since the late 90s. And uh, the librarians uh, I have interacted with are the most confident people in this field. They know much more than I do. I'm just a researcher, right? I've, I've read up on these things, but the professionals are the librarians. And that's why 10 years ago, I had that, that that was my logical conclusion is that if we want to fix something like this, it's the libraries that would do it. They have the money, they have the expertise, they have all it takes. Now, the, the issues here are too complex to tease apart in a, in a quick Q&A. The issues here range from different countries having set up the libraries in a different way. In some cases, in some countries, uh, libraries are more independent and have more leeway. And in other cases, libraries are very much dependent and can't do much. Um, so it's had, it's been very, very tricky um, to get um, a sort of a united front on the library end. There's also a very strong undercurrent in the library uh, sector that I have heard that um, too many people are still afraid of losing, of the library losing any meaning if they don't buy journals anymore, which of course is a misconception because who would be running those publication platforms, those data archives, and who would be curating and maintaining them like they, have, like they have done with scholarly products for centuries? It's the library. So the libraries would come back to the center of university or, or scholarly institutional life. They would be the central infrastructure institution of any scholarly institution, that, as they have been for centuries. And, and they, they've been pushed into this dependent, you know, intermediary, very much in contrast to their historical mission and their, their, their historical role. And the point here is to bring them back to the, their central role that they've used to that they've used to play for centuries. And so that was my idea initially. Oh, libraries, it should be in their own self-interest to do this. But the sort of collective action that needs to be done never materialized. And in terms of um, the chicken and egg problem, yes. So for many, many years, the, a lot of the responses that we've gotten when, we've, when, when we have um, proposed these kinds of uh, ideas and plans was, well, that's pie in the sky, these things don't exist. Well, but now they do exist. If, uh, if, mandate, if, if these uh, funding agencies that I have on the slide, I still have it here in the background, you don't see it, but on my last slide, if those funding agencies say, you won't be eligible for your members won't be able to um, receive any funding if you don't have such a platform that you can where you can switch switch service providers um, all the institutions are going to get one of those platforms and if you hook them all up together bam you have an alternative system that's right there so yes it's a chicken and egg problem that just got solved a few years ago brilliant Bjorn. that's um I think we've exhausted all of the questions and that sort of brings us nicely to time, I think. Um, I'm sure this conversation can go on and I suppose it's desirable that it will go on. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much for, for finishing the, the series for, for the Riot Science Club at Wolverhampton. I think it's been a really informative talk and I'm, I'm so glad that we managed to get you in before Christmas. Uh, Thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And. Uh, uh, I will circulate the recording on our YouTube channel for those who uh, weren't here from the beginning. And also, I think it might be useful, Bjorn, if I circulate your slides, if that's OK as well. Yeah, absolutely. Not a problem. And lots of useful links. I can post them on SlideShare and send you the link. Yeah, that would be. I will tweet them out too. Wonderful. Well, I'll just. Uh, uh, Ian, are you there? If you could just end the live stream, that would be great. And then uh, Bjorn, you can stay on the line and we'll debrief. All right. so. Excellent.